But in the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to uh, share with you something that I've learned while uh, doing this project in Burkina Faso. And maybe we will have also time to reflect on how participatory techniques can be used for uh, research, really, uh, uh, service creation, but also teaching. So my name is Giovanni Nella, and the introduction said it all, so uh, I'm fine with that. And uh, when I was working on this project, actually, I was hired by the Madeira Interactive Technologies Institute. I was supervised by Valentina Nisi. Uh, she is still working there. Uh, while instead, Franco Papeski, he works for the Web Foundation. Um, I prefer the shade. <laughs> uh, but at that time, he was working for, um, for a large uh, like telecom company here in the UK. But he never wants to, to reveal the name, so I cannot tell you that it was wonderful. <laughs> and <laughs> briefly, the project was really about installing and introducing a group of local people in uh, Burkina Faso to the internet. And when we first got engaged by this pro in this project by the Italian NGO Cocopa, we knew very, very little about Burkina Faso. We barely knew where Burkina Faso was. And of course, we started doing the conventional research. We look at statistics. And all these statistics were depicting this country that ranks always very low in every chart that we use to define wealth whether that is GDP or employment rate, life expectancy. It's a poor country. It's a country where almost half of the population lives below poverty line. And obviously, it's something very different from anything that me, Valentina, and Franco were used to. So when we first got there, because of the red sand, we started calling it Mars. That's the, that's the cheesy part. <laughs> but actually, I think that that little thing helped us a lot because it helped us to detach ourselves from the context and to understand that everything we thought we might have known actually could have worked differently. So if that was Mars, actually we were the aliens there. So the fact that it's a different planet, you don't really see it from the statistics that I just showed you, but from the very little things, so everyday things. And I'm going to tell you this anecdote uh, which can give you an idea of how things work. So at one point, after a few weeks that we were there, me and Franco started having this food nostalgia, which for Italians means craving for pizza. <laughs> and we were very, we were kind of ashamed. I mean, local food is delicious, but still, not really what you want to have for two months. Um, ashamed, we were ashamed, and we shared this desire with the locals, with the participants. With this one girl, she was taking part to our workshop, CV. And obviously, we knew that, uh, the closest pizzeria was to town 200 kilometers away in the capital. And we didn't expect any pizza delivery to get there. <laughs> we were just sharing our, you know, unease. Uh, but Sylvie didn't see any problem with that. And that was really surprising. She picked up the phone. And at that point, I thought that she was doing some, um, I've been, you know, before going to Burkina Faso, I've been doing proper research. I've been listening to all the talks by, Ian Chip Chase from Nokia and all those people. And they talk a lot about this money transferring, credit, the credit transferring through the phone. So I was very excited. I said, OK, now she's going to transfer some money. Something's going to happen. And I told her, and she said, no. She waved in front of my face a banknote. And she said, this is cash's money. They didn't know anything about that credit thing, which I don't know. If maybe some of you is involved in projects in developing countries. and they have experienced that, I don't know. So anyway, what she does is very simple. She called a cousin in the capital, uh, because if you are a Burkina Bay, you have a relative in the capital. And she said, be at the bus station at a certain time when the bus from Waiguia gets there. And in the meanwhile, we walk to the local bus station, and we hand in some money, some cash, to, to the driver, because they offer this service. They, like, they work as courier as well. So, they charge you a little fee and they move around your cash together with the people in the bus. And apparently, it's, uh, it's a safe thing to do. So actually, our cash traveled all the way down and finally got to the cousin. Cousin gets the money, goes to buy the pizza, takes the pizza back to the driver because they offer also the service of moving small goods, not necessarily pizza. I think that was the first time. <laughs> and the pizza travels all the way up and we are finally, after four hours, we're having the pizza. Um, it was cold, 
<laughs> which in Burkina Faso is a good thing. Uh, but good, I mean, um, we were amazed how things work. So things do work. They just work in a different way than you might expect. So the question that we were asked a lot, especially by the, the Italian NGO before doing the project, was why would you install the internet there? Uh, which I always thought it was a silly question, but actually it was not. And we had to come up with a good reason why we wanted to install the internet. So we observed the project that NGOs usually work on. Uh, and we realized that they work on two typology of projects. One is uh, acting on the immediate. Uh, usually the common example is like uh, when there is a war or uh, an epidem epidemia, they send uh, uh, like medic medicaments and stuff to, to find a quick solution to this extreme situation. The other one is working on long term, like aspirational projects. Classic example is opening a school. So something that is going to give you an outcome in seven, eight years. And we wanted to work on the medium term, something that could have given some outcome in uh, like three to five years. And I think we share this vision that the internet could help in uh, generating things. It's a tool, not a solution, which is what we really wanted to bring there. And the internet is a read and write technology. So it's not only Googling things or poking people on Facebook which they learn very quick anyway. It's also about contributing. Uh, it's, uh, contribution is at its center. We were really curious about this technology would have interacted with the local culture. We know that technology mediates culture they, and culture mediates technology. They interact with each other and they generate unexpected outcome in the best case. But at that point, the NGO was convinced, also because through the years, they've been running projects there for several years. They set up this, uh, it's a room really, where they put some uh, computers and they also organized some courses about uh, basic computer literacy. So what was missing there was just the internet and we convinced them to do this little extra effort. And our project was very well defined at this point. We were in Waiguya, in the north of Burkina Faso. We were working with 20 locals between 18 and 40 years old with basic familiarity with computer. We were there to teach the internet, which is what the NGO wanted us to do, and explore the impact on people's daily lives. We were there for about two months. And our lessons were structured in a very simple manner. We would introduce them to some tools that we usually use, like can be Flickr, Wikipedia, YouTube, uh, emails, uh, Google Maps, Skype. So it was really about the theory of it, how it works. Not really how we use it, but how it works mainly. And then let them play with it. They had uh, as much time as they wanted to explore the medium, ask us questions, we would work with them anyway. But every session, would end with a key question. This question was, what would you do with this? And this question was really aiming for a, what benefit you want to get from this technology that I just introduced you. Uh, for example, Google Maps. This is Abel. Abel was really fascinated by Google Maps. He had this idea that with Google Maps, it could enhance tourism in uh, Waiguya. I'm not sure tourism is going to be the next big thing in Waiguya, but anyway, it was really putting much effort in creating these maps. It, it, it will take the camera and zip around with his scooter, detect some interesting spots, take a picture, put it on the map, put a short description. And it seemed very conventional to that point, but he introduced an unexpected element that was a telephone number. We asked him, what is this telephone number? Who, who is the telephone number? He said, well, in Waiguya, you have some spots that um, have a meaning for us, but that information you cannot find it anywhere. It's not online, it's not in the library. It's only few people that live in that area that know the story of those artifacts. So the system was, so tourists will flock around Waiguya at some point in time. They will be given of a map, and that map would allow them to 
get to these interesting spots. And if they wanted, they could call the person to have a, a tour guide on remote through the phone. It was a sort of like very low tech augmented reality kind of thing. And the idea itself, of course, had many things that wouldn't have worked, like the language or how you, you would pay the tour guide. There were many parts that weren't really solved yet. But we learned a lot from that, because uh, Abel was revealing as an hidden layer of location-based information that was just waiting to be surfaced. He was creating a new set of services based on the involvement of local people through a digital layer. And he was disclosing cultural elements. So some people have the role of keeping information through oral storytelling. And all that was coming from his concept, really. Uh, this is Ole. Uh, instead, he was more interesting in Skype. And he also came up with an interesting idea. He told us, I, I make drums. And I sell drums to white people when they happen to be here because of the NGOs. So, White people are not really skilled with drums. So once they go home, in, back in Europe or wherever they live, they stop playing the drums. Uh, I tried to, to prove him wrong, but I'm not skilled with drums neither. So. <laughs> Basically, his idea was very simple. I, he said, I'm going to sell the drum together with my Skype contact so that the Western people can go home when they go home, can contact me and have some lessons on remote. We prototyped that idea too. They were very sketchy and uh, quick prototypes. It was easy to prototype in this way. But while prototyping it, we had a long conversation about what is a contact, what is, what is friendship. And it turned out that for him, having a contact in uh, Europe is uh, something that has to do with status. Like It's a cool thing. It's not only for him, it was for all the people there. And that, again, is an information that I wonder if the technology wasn't there, if we weren't there to prototype, how we would have had those conversations, how we would have accessed that information. So why is this way of proceeding good? Well, for participants, it's a more practical way of learning and a chance to generate concepts of services and micro-businesses that would make sense into their life. For us, their idea were effective ways to gather insights about the local culture and context. And the information gathered wasn't going everywhere. It was actually very pertinent to that specific technology. So when we were talking about Google Maps, we were talking about the local territory and how they perceive it. And Skype is about friendship and context and communication. So it was very pertinent to that specific technology introduced and its application there. So this is for the academia aficionados out there, which I think are there. So this way of proceeding, it, it exists in academia. It's, uh, it's called technology probes. Technology probes work in the way that I just described it. So you have a participant and a facilitator. So the tool is presented, and the participant gets to know the tool. He absorbs information while the facilitator facilitates the concept generation. And once you have the concept, you can interpret it. You can learn a lot from it. So it's technology probes uh, similar to cultural probes? Yes, very much so. Uh, but there is a key difference, that when cultural probes uh, spin around continuation, they kind of tap into everyday life. Technology probes, at least in our case, was spinning around this idea of disruption. It was uh, letting the user depict themselves through, through change, really. And it was drawing future scenarios. So what? So uh, I thought I took this one out before. No, so OK. So mm, beside, the, be, beside the, the, the academic learning, there is also something that I would like to share with you, which might sound banal, but actually is what I came back home with. And the first thing is don't teach make. So people are more interested when they practice and have some autonomy. You probably experience that if you are educators. But especially in that context, the status of the, of the teacher, the, the relationship teacher and student is a very rigid one. So they wouldn't ask questions. And I think that my, by making things together, we, kind of over, uh, we could overtake this uh, barrier that was formed. The other one is let them design. Because concepts reveal people, culture, needs, and dreams much more than a focus group. 
they were telling us a lot. We could have had those conversations, I believe, only if they were in charge of coming up with the concepts. Otherwise, I don't think we would have had those conversations, not in that way, probably. Misusing is designing. Facilitate tinkering beyond what is proposed, which is what we try to do. We introduce the technology, but we also ask them to misuse it. Uh, I think that all the uses that they propose were somehow not the way that we would use it. And anybody learning something is a potential teacher. This is what we are experiencing now. So the people that we talk to are now teaching to other people. So I went back there recently and we have now a sort of second generation internet users, uh, which is uh, what we really wanted. We wanted this chain reaction. So basically this is it. Uh, I think I'm early on the schedule. No? Um, well, anyway, so there is a website, there's a blog that uh, if you want to, uh, but you can also, I don't know if you have been to the exhibition uh, that um, Culture Lab is organizing, there, is, there are a few copies of my book, you can buy it on uh, Amazon, don't, because uh, yeah. there you can get the PDF, and the website is, I guess if you Google, Google in Burkina, you, you land there. I'm very bad with name. Google, so Google, Google in Burkina, you're gonna get that. Otherwise, you can contact me at giovanni.inella.gmail.com. I will be very happy to answer to all your questions. Is it early? That's so, great. Yeah? That's great. So, have any questions at all? Thank you for your amazing presentation. Thank I really you. enjoyed it. Um, I just, I don't know if I should say, but uh, at the exhibition you were talking about failures. Yeah. And it's, quote, it's the biggest failure of your life. <laughs> so I was it's just interested to know more about it because it doesn't seem like a failure at all to me. So. No, I mean, uh, I had a chat with somebody at the round table there. And um, I have to say that because my presentation, I hide the failures. But this, uh, this way of proceeding, the technology probes thing, is actually is a consequence of a failure that we were experiencing. Like the first weeks, um, we tried to prototype ideas that we generated while, while in Europe, while in Portugal, and they were all failing, one after the other. And the reason why they were failing is because we didn't know anything about the context, and the, especially the cultural context. But I'm going to give you this example to you because I think it's uh, cool. I gave it to somebody before, but um, let's see if we fail also in this one. But so this was uh, one idea that we generated b before going there, there. The idea was uh, one of the local craft is a batik. I don't know if you know anything about batik. It's a way, it's a technique for dyeing fabrics and making illustrations. So we say it would be really amazing if you people from Europe could send to Batik artists in uh, Burkina Faso some pictures so that the Burkina Faso artists could elaborate the picture into a Batik and send it back. It would be an interesting business model. And then once I went there, I met Maurice, he's a Batik uh, uh, artist. And we had this long talk, like two hours, about how beautiful Batik is. It's really great. Batik is be really great to, I'm sure that this thing is going to work, the service is going to work. We tried to prototype it instead. In fact, I sent him this picture of mine. <laughs> I mean, I gave it by hand because I was there. I told him, look, I give you this picture. Can you make a batik of it? But I because you are an artist, I want an interpretation. I don't want a, a copy. And after a few days, he came back with this beautiful painting oil on canvas. And at that point, I was very frustrated. I was like, we talk about batik, it's beautiful. But you do oil on, on, on canvas. It doesn't seem to work anywhere. Really well. And he was, um, he was surprised. Because he said, no, I just, I forgot about batik. Because with batik, I cannot make a perfect copy. Because as a batik, as an artist, or when people ask me, come with a picture, what they want is a copy. And so I just felt uh, compelled to change the technique and make oil on canvas to make the perfect copy of what you send me. 
Um, it was obviously useless to explain him that I can print as many copies as I want of that image because it's deep, and so on. But then finally I got the batik, and the batik works. But if this thing was taking a lot of days, and it was failed, this is only one example, but it was like everything we tried to prototype, every idea that was conceived before was failing. That's why we dropped it and we started with problems. But the failures, you find them in the book that you can download. Hello. Hey. I'm over here. What? Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering what's been left in place in terms of sort of the internet. Because you said that you've got these sort of second generation that's happening. Yeah. So what, I mean, what's, what's, what's kind of going on now? What's being used in terms of the internet? Yeah, I mean, the... Um, Technology is there, so they still have the internet connection, obviously. And they organized some courses by themselves. The, municip the local municipality decided to play a role, so they are paying the, um, the salary to some of the people that we have trained, to train other people. And they are, uh, so far I have to say that they're still being quite passive users. Like, the services, they, they didn't make. And I mean, there are many reasons. One, <laughs> this is a fail. Uh, one reason is probably uh, because they they're not skilled enough. And the other reason, I think, is because the because there is a salary from the municipality that is uh, preventing uh, this will of creating a business. Like these people is is being paid, and they don't see the they don't have enough motivation to start something that makes money little thing, how does the internet connection work? Is it in one place? Or yeah, it it's this one room and there are five computers and the internet, uh, the connection is uh, is like one mega or something like that. But it's uh, slow, but it's free, it's for free. They have all access for free, anybody from the from small town. So one last little thing, uh, do they have internet cafes there? Is that they have it in proximity, but uh, Does that undercut that at all, those local businesses? No. Yeah, it did add an impact. On, I, I don't think that those people, the Internet Cafe, are very happy that we did this project. But the Internet Cafe are fairly far from this place, and their connection is really, I mean, they're ripping off people money because they, the connection is bad and they charge a lot. But they're not too close, so it's actually a different. Mine was just an observation. I've spent quite a bit of time out in Africa as well, and I just wanted to know what you thought about the kind of almost inherent genius of the children, because they automatically knew how to use computers, which just kind of blew my mind a little bit as someone that has kind of hit his head against a computer screen on several times. Yeah. Um, I just was wondering, because the examples you sh you shown were, were adults, I was wondering kind of what work you did with, with the children. Yeah, the children were uh, part of the training, and I have to say that I had the same impression that you had. They were not really um, willing in, um, in creating like concepts, but they will use the internet a lot. And they were much faster and cle more clever than the others. And I can only, to confirm your uh, observation, I can only confirm it actually, uh, is this one child, is he, like nine years old, and he, now he, he has my Skype contacts, and he continuously Skype it to me. And what he asks is stuff like, can, next time you come over, can you bring some mobile, some yeah, mobile phones, or can you bring a laptop, and stuff like that. He's not ashamed, he just go for it. Um, and actually I did. Uh, I asked my friend, and I did bring this stuff. And it's amazing how this one child, empowered with the internet, uh, is now, I'm sure that he doesn't do that only with me. I'm sure that he asks for mobile phones to all his contacts. Mm -hmm. And now he's uh, probably able to just 
have I don't know, a dozen of 